another fundamentals video. This time around, I'll be covering the basics of 3D and Photoshop. To start off, we'll need a subject. Photoshop can open and use real 3D objects for most 3D formats, including OEJ files, 3D Studio files, and 3DS files. This is as easy as dragging the 3D file of your choice into Photoshop. If you don't have any of these to experiment with, and you don't have After Effects CC, which comes with a light version of Cinema 4D in which you can create objects to experiment with, they're easy enough to find and play around with. That said, you can also make them right inside of Photoshop. With your document open, go into the 3D window, and if the layer you've selected isn't already a 3D scene, you'll see everything grayed out except for the source bar. This is where you'll pick what you're making into 3D. If you're using a work path, which you'll make with the pen tool, or the current selection, which is exactly what it sounds like, your only option will be to create a 3D experience extrusion which is giving it depth, but it'll automatically be generated based on the shape of your path or selection. The file source option won't give you any of these options and will, when you click create, open a window for you to manually hunt for your 3D file in a more roundabout way than just dragging them into Photoshop. The selected layer option will give you the most customization. To start with, you can create a 3D postcard which will make your selected layer or layers into a flat plane. This is now a 3D object which can react to lighting, be textured and demorph, and moved around in 3D space. Honestly though, I don't know why this is still an option, because the mesh presets exist. The mesh presets are pre-built objects you can turn your layers into. Among them are options to make your layer into a plane, which is the exact same thing as a post card. You can also make cubes, spheres, pyramids, rings, even a wine bottle. There are plenty of options. These objects will replace your previous layer with what's a type of smart object which will work in 3D space. Just like with smart objects, you now have the ability to edit the content inside and have it reflect on the object itself. These are different, however, since some objects will have multiple files like this that you can open depending on how complex the object is or the way the texture is applied to your model. Alternatively, you can also create a 3D object with a depth map preset instead. Instead of the smooth surface that you get from your mesh presets, depth map presets will morph, warp, and distort the object you create using the grayscale values of your image that you're using. While cool, it should be noted that even though Photoshop's 3D engine in general can slog your computer down, if you're using a complex image for this depth map, it will throttle your computer. The last option is to create a 3D volume. Volumes are a way to combine multiple overlaid images into a fully 3D object. This feature was designed to combine DICOM frames, or the slides that are made by MRI and other medical scanning machines, and turn them into usable 3D renders of the body part being scanned. I don't have any of those lying around, unfortunately and the average person probably won't either, so I can't really show that. But if you do, once you have your object, you can then change how the volume's applied to it and can render your object out as an image or a 3D object, which can then be used in your scenes or 3D printed for casts. Speaking of, if you're building a 3D scene with more than one object, you'll probably notice something a bit off. In the 3D window, you only have one object showing, and when you move the camera or lights, it only moves them around that one object, while the rest of the objects you've made don't get changed at all. This is because each object you make or bring into Photoshop creates its own scene, which doesn't interact with the other objects from other scenes. Fortunately, there's a way to fix this and make them all into one single scene where they will interact. Go back to the Layers panel and select all the object layers you want in your scene. 
Then, going up into the 3D menu at the top of Photoshop, you'll see high up on the list the option to merge 3D layers. Click that, and it'll combine all the objects into one scene. If you moved your objects beforehand and they jump around after this, it's because you moved the scene camera and not the objects themselves. For 3D scenes, you need to select the objects you want to work with in the 3D window, or it'll default to the camera instead. A simple way to fix this is to hold down SHIFT when you click to merge the layers. This will keep the objects in place exactly how you wanted them, though the lighting camera will default and apply the same to all the objects in your new scene. Which was hopefully the goal, else you can just leave them as individual individual objects. Inside of your scene, you can do a bit of organizing. Like the layers panel, the 3D panel lets you group your objects together. To do this, you can select multiple layers by holding down command on a Mac or control on a PC and in the 3D panel, clicking on the objects you want to group. Once you have all of them selected, you then go into the 3D menu at the top of the 3D window or at the top of Photoshop and select group objects to combine. Them. If you have a lot of objects and want to combine everything, you can also skip that selection part and just choose to group all objects in scene in the same menus. Also just like layers, you can double click the name of your 3D object and rename it for better organization. So that's the basics of setting up a scene. but. The models are looking a bit off, right? If you bring an OBJ file in, it'll probably be entirely gray. And if you make the object in Photoshop, it might have warped your layer in ways that you were not expecting. To fix this, let's get into texturing a bit. Whether it's an object or a scene, a 3D file you brought in, or something you made inside of Photoshop, you can find your textures in both the 3D and layers panels. In the layers panel, you'll find your layer, and if the small arrow on the right side is active, you'll see your textures below that, as you would see with styles. These will include the diffusion, which is the actual texturing itself, the image-based light, or IBL, which is how your lights react to the textures and depth. Just like with smart objects, if you double-click these layers, they'll open a separate file in Photoshop, which will contain the graphics used for your texture for part of the model, on which you can make edits, save, and then it'll carry over. Also there is the UV map, which shows a wireframe guideline to how the texture is applied to your model while you're doing these edits. These maps can sometimes be a nightmare, depending on how complex the model is and how well made the mesh is. Often though, they'll give you a starting point on figuring out where your textures go so you don't have to do quite as much testing. Like I said, once you change these files and save them, you'll hop over to your original file and that model will now have the new textures applied. There are also ways to export these images that you've made and take them over to 3D programs and apply them to your models which have been rigged and set up for your scenes, but that will be a different video down the road. For more complicated models or scenes, the 3D panel has a list of all the objects in your scene and each of their components, which will make hunting a bit easier than the layers panel, which just puts everything in a giant list. To add the textures from here, it is a bit different. First, you'll also need to use the properties panel. The properties panel lets you see all the information about a currently selected object, mask, or adjustment layer. For a 3D scene, the properties you're seeing will change based on what you've selected, whether it be the scene as a whole, the lights, the camera, the objects, the parts of an object, or the materials inside of the parts inside of the object. For texturing, we'll be dealing with the materials. With any of the materials in your object selected, the properties panel will give you 13 different options. Starting at the top, the diffuse is the color of your material. It can be solid color or any 2D content you want to load into it. You can also make a diffusion map by painting on the model, 
But again, that's going to be another video down the road. Specular, meanwhile, is the color displayed in the highlights on your model. After that, illumination gives your model color that doesn't use a scene's lighting, which makes your object appear like it's lit inside. After that, the ambient property is the color for the light visible in your reflections. On the right side of these is the material picker. This lets you change what your model is made of, with a variety of presets to pick from, ranging from glass and cotton fabric to moss and wood, with options to load in custom textures for these as well. Up next is the shine property, which disperses and spreads the light reflected on your object. After that is the reflection property, which as I'm sure you can imagine, is what lets your object reflect objects in the 3D scene around it. The roughness property is how blurred your reflections and highlights will be on your object. After that, exactly what it sounds like, the bump property gives the material bumps without actually altering the mesh itself. You can also create custom bump maps where lighter values will make things raised and darker colors will flatten the material out. Following that, the opacity changes how opaque your material is, letting you show things through your models where this material setting appears. As opposed to reflection, refraction changes the light direction where two medias, such as air and water, meet. On the bottom of the panel, you can also change your normal and environment. The normal map increases surface details on your image. Unlike bump maps, which use grayscale, normal maps use RGB, with each color representing the X, Y, and Z position on your model's surface. The environment, on the other hand, is what applies to the area around your 3D models and acts as your scene. Environment maps are spherical 3D panoramas. If you have an object or a few that have increased reflection, the environment will be reflected on that object. For all of these, you can load in pre-existing image files to use as your textures, as well as edit the existing textures and create new ones. Now, if you're using complex models or textures, you might notice Photoshop slowing down. 3D in Photoshop is a massive resource hog, and isn't an optimized program created specifically for 3D, like something like Smith Micro's Poser or Autodesk's Maya. As such, slowdowns should be expected. That said, there are a few things you can do to make it a little bit faster. Firstly, with the objects, or just certain parts of the object selected, go into the 3D menu and choose to simplify meshes. The dialog box that opens has two sides. On the left side is a preview of your object with 3D move tools. These tools let you spin the object, roll your camera, move the object up and down, and left and right, and move your object closer and further from the camera. With the move tool active in the the regular canvas and an object selected, you can do these same things. On the other side of the window is the arguably more important features of this dialog box. These are your mesh settings. On the top, you have a readout of how many polygons make up your selected objects, and the more complex the object and textures, the higher this number will be, meaning slower Photoshop. Across from that is also an estimated size with a slider above it. Dragging that slider to the the left will decrease the amount of polygons in the object, making it simpler and less resource hogging. You can also use the estimated size as a guideline, so you could take that percentage, keep it in mind, and apply it across everything in the scene so it'll all be the same percent. Beneath these are the material settings. If you choose to generate normal maps, which are normal maps as explained just a bit earlier, you can create new resized 
texture files for your image. You can also change the size of your texture file here, scaling from 128 pixels by 128 to 4096 pixels by 4096. The larger you make this file, the more detail you'll have to work with. To make things even faster, you can also turn off shadows, the mesh overlay, and a preview of a simplification below this. With these turned on, you'll get an accurate representation of your changes as you go at the cost of making the whole process slower. Especially if you're going from a model with, say, dozens of thousands of polygons to a few hundred polygons, that preview will take a while to render every single time you change anything. Once you're satisfied, click OK and you'll be returned to your scene. Another way to simplify things a bit more is to combine all your object's meshes into one single mesh. To do this, go into the 3D menu and roughly halfway down, choose to generate UVs. This will open a warning window the first time you do this, telling you that to generate UVs you'll need to flatten all the materials, textures in your object. If this is a concern, cancel out, make a duplicate of your 3D layer in the layers panel, and make the changes to the copy. If it's okay from the start, just click OK, and a new dialog box will open. These new options you'll be given will choose whether all of the materials will be merged, and how you want to unwrap the UVs. Considering I've mentioned them a few times, I should probably go over those. So UV maps are a texture file that matches coordinates in the 2D image you're making with your texture to areas on the 3D model so you can wrap the 2D image around the 3D. You can also choose whether to preserve the current appearance of the model or not and what size you want the new file to be. Once you hit OK, you can open your new mesh. So that was 3D objects. Just a bit more to cover for the first look. On to the scenes themselves. To start with, as I said just a bit ago, you can also move, rotate, roll, and scale your objects using the move tool while a 3D object or scene is active. Depending on what you've selected in the 3D window, you might be moving the camera though, so make sure you pay attention to what's selected. As a shortcut, you'll also see a small box over any object you have selected. This is the axis for your objects and lets you do everything all these tools allows depending on where on that box's surface you're clicking and dragging. Another part of your scene beyond the objects and camera is the lights. Photoshop, or any 3D program really, gives you the option for three types of lights to put in your scenes each of which interacts with your objects differently. These are the point, spot, and infinite lights. All 3D scenes will automatically be given an infinite light by default, except for postcards. Infinite lights work like sunlight, with shadows being presented on the opposite side of any object facing the light. A point light, on the other hand, is more like a light bulb with the ability to move it around. Shadows are also more angled for this type of light with less softness on the shadows. Spotlights on the other hand are concentrated cones of light which get dimmer the closer to the cone's edge you get. This is the more complex of the lights, letting you be more selective about limiting the highlights and shadows more so than the other. And lastly for this video is rendering. The process of rendering is taking a file you're working with and making it into a flattened image. Whether a video, a Photoshop file with layers, or 3D, you're rendering it when you save it as a video file or as a JPEG or what have you. With 3D though, it's also taking all of the data in your scene and bit by bit making it into that image. This will take a while, but it will be better than the image 
preview that you get before you render. And that was 3D in Photoshop. I didn't go over things like 3D printing and painting here because this was already getting long, but I have plans to go over those in the yet unforeseen future. Look forward to it. Also, I hope you all enjoyed. You can let me know by commenting below, liking the video, or subscribing for more awesome content. Have a great day, everyone.